exciting. Hello, Jenny. You said exciting because we record this on Zoom and you heard the lady say recording in progress. Heard. <laughs> and every time it gets me, I think she's so funny. Like she, I always picture her like sort of watching us the whole time we're recording this. It feels very <laughs> official when she chimes in. <laughs> so um, I let me start by introducing myself. So I am Megan Holmes and I am here at the Needlepoint Clubhouse just outside of the city of St. Louis, Missouri. And I um, have the great opportunity with my friend, Melissa McLeod of the Wool and the Floss to um, present about every other week these days, the Pointing It Out podcast. And for those people who have been watching us for a long time, you'll know that we started the, believe it or not, Jenny, back in like, tr like the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, sort of. Oh, I was there. You started on Instagram first. And we did. I was there. I saw. Oh, I'm so glad. That's funny. And not, no one's ever said that to me before. I started what I called the um, designer sofa series. Yes, I remember. And uh, Joanna was my first guest. And then Melissa was doing some things on Instagram. And anyway, we decided to join together and start this thing that we call the Pointing It Out podcast. We're now on both the uh, YouTube video platform as well as the audio platform. Anywhere you get a podcast, you can hear us, which is why I wear these super dorky headphones and I have this big giant microphone because it kind of makes it easier Um for our producer to, to get the audio and stuff. But anyway, so for those of you watching video, you'll see that I've got a really bizarre background. Um, and to my, I think it turns out right when we actually show this on uh, the video platform, I have a lovely woman who I've actually had the opportunity several times to meet in person. And I will let you introduce yourself. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, who are you and where are you? Person. Hello, I'm Jenny Sandberg. Um, I design Needlepoint, uh, Jenny Sandberg Needlepoint. Uh, and I do a lot of other things too, which I I'm probably going to talk about. Which I love. I can't wait to get into that. But so it appears to me that you're in your home. And if you are in your home, do you really always have fresh florals sitting behind you? My birthday was last week. So <gasps> Happy birthday. Are you a Taurus then with me? I'm Gemini, Gemini. Oh, wait a second. So I'm May 9th. I'm May 23rd. So we must be just missing each other somehow. Yeah, I'm, I'm on the Victorian cusp. So I get some Taurus. Oh, oh okay. Well, well happy, did. happy yeah. belated birthday for those people listening. Jenny has a beautiful pink floral arrangement behind her. And what appears to maybe be, what do you call this? Is this your studio? Is this your office space? It's someplace in your home. Uh, it's my, it's my studio slash living room. I just, mo I moved here in Charlottesville to a smaller apartment. I used to have like a big two bedroom apartment with the thought of like having that big glorious studio that so many people seem to have. Sure. Didn't, didn't work out because I, I work for myself from home and I just tend to sort of nest in wherever I am. And I don't really need that much space. Like I don't have a, a living room for entertaining people. It's essentially my studio where there I you live work so that works out so let's um let's kind of start there so so home would you call home charlottesburg charlottesville sorry charlottesville oops sorry 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 i know those are two separate places sorry um, charlottesville for the for the moment uh i've lived here i've lived in this area a little over about two and a half years now but you didn't um, grow up there no, 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 no. I am, uh, these days I'm very peripatetic. I move a lot these Good days. Good word. That's a bonus word. <laughs> Good word. I like that. And it's very true for me. That's why I know it. Because <laughs> I move a lot. Uh, I lived in New York for a very long time. I lived mm -hmm. there for like 30 years. Practically. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Virginia. In okay. Virginia. All right. And then you, did you get a formal education? So do you have any degrees? <laughs> I think asked, I know the answer to this. Yeah, she asks knowingly. I have so many degrees. <laughs> I, I have love it. I loved I love school it. a lot. I really loved school. Um, so I grew up for the most part in Virginia and I wanted out as quickly as possible. So I went to school in New York um, at NYU and I got a degree in art history. Okay. Kind of useful. Uh, and I liked school so much that I reluctantly went back to Virginia, to the University of Virginia here in Charlottesville and okay. got a master's in architectural history. Also okay. not very useful. Still wasn't quite done with school. I didn't want to get a PhD. I was going to say, so is that, a, is that a bachelor's and a master's or do you have two bachelor's degrees? A bachelor's and a master's okay. and another master's degree um, in the history of decorative arts and design. Oh my God. Yeah. Cause so I- So cool. Yeah, that was at the Cooper Hewitt um, program in New York uh, that goes through Parsons and New School. And that's where 
you know, after you do a master's degree once, you go and get the second one, you kind of have the system down pat. So I was like a star student. <laughs> Like, they thought I was a genius. I'm like, it's just because I'm doing this for the second time. Like, don't, don't be fooled. <laughs> well, you know, I have a bachelor's and a master's and I got the master's when I was working full time. And I actually, I don't know, worked a little harder on my master's degree. I think. Well, I mean, the, time, the second time it's like, you're like, okay, I am, I know what the assignment is. I That's know, right. I know how That's to do right. a presentation. I know how to write a paper. I know how to do the research. And it also, because I was doing it in New York, I had, being the star student there gets you a lot of opportunities. I mean, I did a, amazing internships um, at the best museums in the world often. Like I, I interned at the Met in the American wing. Um, and as soon as I graduated, they offered me a job. I got, you know, an internship at the Brooklyn Museum, um, winter tour in Delaware. I worked in their textiles department. So it just sort of gave me all these opportunities because I gave them a lot of money <laughs> to get that second master's degree. And yeah, it worked out okay. So were you a full-time student oh, during yeah. that whole time? Okay. I went straight through, all the way through for all okay. of that. Okay. Okay. So, um, so you're, I'm sorry, where was the ending point? Back in New York at the? Yeah. 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 Okay. So at the Cooper Hewitt program. Okay. All right. And so you finish that program and you say to yourself, well, now I've got three degrees. Well, as literally as soon as I finished, the curator in the American Wing that I had been interning for offered me a job immediately, which was great. But because working at the Met, I mean, it's amazing. You walk up those steps and you go through the medieval hall. I mean, it's fantastic. You're working with the smartest people on a big five-year project, big exhibition, all good. Like what could be bad? Well, <laughs> They kind of don't pay you very much. I was about to say, I bet you the pay is what you're going to say. Yeah, they don't pay you very much. And living in New York is not inexpensive. Um, so, you know, some of my fellow research assistants were married to Wall Street guys mm. and Park Avenue and as smart and as wonderful a human being as you could ever hope for. But they didn't have to worry about getting paid right. tiny amounts of money. Right. Right, right. So yeah, it, it, I did that for a while. I didn't stick through it, stick with it through the end of the project. I couldn't afford to. <laughs> Got you. Well, shocker, right? Yes, I get that. So did at any time, did you have what we would call like a side hustle or was this just like your full-time job that whole time? And then you looked at yourself and said, wait, I need a different job. Yeah, well... I was actually, I got a, a postgraduate fellowship and I was doing that concurrently with the Met. Got it. I was like my side hustle was my work. My work was my side hustle. Like I got kind you. of- Mm -hmm. both of those at the same time. Um, but eventually, because I was super young and ambitious, I <laughs> wanted to uh I wanted to be the, the 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 queen curator of the planet. I love decorative arts. I wanted I wanted to get on that track to be, I wanted to be a curator at the Met. And the way you get that job is that you either start as a research assistant and stay there forever. Okay. <laughs> go out and you become curator at a little place, curator at a medium-sized place. And then maybe someday you can go back and be curator at the big place. So I left to be curator at a little place, a little house museum uh, in, uh, what's the name of the town? Garrison, New York, up the Hudson River. Um, okay. And it was terrible. I hated it just deeply. <laughs> oh, you hated the the small town or the small museum or? Yes. Yes. All of okay. That. Okay. Uh, it just didn't work for you. Yeah, it just didn't work out. It just wasn't the right fit. It wasn't the right place. Um, it's one of those, it's not far from New York. Uh, it's about not even an hour and a half north of New York up the Hudson. Beautiful location. It's right across from West Point, right across um, this bend in the mm. Hudson. Um, but I didn't know anybody out there. I thought all my friends mm. would come visit me out in the country. They <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. So yeah, and horror, I got fired from that job. For what? What could that be? Um, the director decided to eliminate the position of curator at this decorative arts museum. Wow. Yeah, um, that that was a whole kerfuffle with the board and lawyers and like all of that. It, it kind of sounds like that might have been a blessing for you, though. Best thing that ever could have happened. I mean, sure. it, really, it totally, totally was because it forced me to figure out something else because indeed I didn't have that husband working on Wall Street. So all of a sudden, Bummer. That, yeah, <laughs> the financial <laughs> impetus, you're like, okay, you need to figure this out right now. Right. So I talked to um, my curator friend at the Brooklyn Museum and he said, Jen, Barry Harwood, fabulous man, 
he sadly died not too long ago. He said, Jenny, would you ever consider working in an auction house? And I was like, oh my God, no. Are you kidding me? Really? That sounds fascinating to me. Is that like below the belt for a like a museum curator? Yeah, the, it, it, they call it a three-legged stool. So there's museum curators, there's auction house people, and there are dealers. And the the curators are like the saintly scholars. <laughs> sacrifice for the good of, they're the custodians of objects and they do research and they toil and they do all of this for the greater good right horrible people I mean my impression of the auction world was like these people are stupid they don't know what they're doing they are greedy just money grubbers I hate all of them they're terrible and how dare you <laughs> get that I would ever do that like that was seriously I remember because there was a job opening at Doyle's which is a, an auction house on the Upper East Side and I remember if you've ever been into an interview where you just absolutely don't care, you just don't care. It's the easiest way to interview ever. I've never <laughs> done that, but it kind of sounds lovely. I know, fantastic. Because you're just like, whatever, ask me any question. Like, Take I, me or leave me. Yeah, I don't need to impress you. Like I, this is sure. clearly not the thing, but it all worked out because I started working there um, as a specialist and it's very, very different from museums any museum <laughs> like, it's hard it's really it's a lot of hard work and the reason there are mistakes in auction catalogs is that you crank through property you just look at a million things you're constantly on deadline and and you know that's the best and the best of times and the worst of times because you're just you get to see amazing things all the time yep Yep. And yet you constantly have to be producing tons of work. <laughs> right. So I know how a little bit about how this story ends, but what I want, and, and we can, we can throw that punchline in here in a minute, but I'm wondering if at any point during this trail of education and tears and stuff, did needlepoint in your life pop in at any point during this time? Well, I studied when I was in graduate school um, at the Cooper Hewitt, you have to concentrate on just like any program, you have to concentrate in certain areas. And one of my areas of expertise was 18th century French textiles. Oh, wow. Fascinating. Also not very useful. I specialize in useless things. Um, <laughs> but you have to, you know, I took the history of my coursework, the history of textiles. I interned with the textiles department at Winter Tour. So you sort of see a lot of needlework historical needlework sure. um was I crafty no really not in the least no. so okay so I hope we're gonna keep in keep in mind I'm waiting for the point when you start needle pointing okay so we're gonna keep going down the down the so the journey so you're at Doyle's you take that job and you do that for a little while and I, I know two other things about you that I'm waiting when they pop in so keep going well I, I bet I know what one of them is because at Doyle's I started um as at Doyle's I was working on the American furniture sales I did 19th century French furniture I did Tiffany glass I did a Barbie auction stop oh I did <laughs> it's true a girl Are there still, is there still like OG like the original Barbie in the package in places oh yeah yeah and that's what this auction was how cool I, I'm not even like spilling any tea on this guy who was the consigner because um he was I forget the exact way he did it I think the consigner he wasn't actually the consigner but the person who collected all these Barbies and Bakelite jewelry and just amazing amazing decorative arts that came to Doyle's this guy got them because he was like an accountant at a big law firm and he embezzled millions and millions of dollars. And what he did with that money is that he bought Barbie dolls. Oh, stop. Oh, no. That's bizarre. So wait, hold on. I'm going to take a quick turn. What year was Barbie? Was she 19 in the fifties? Was that her first iteration? Yeah, 59. Okay. Oh God, I should know. But that's okay. I'm not putting you on the spot, but anyway, wow. Yeah, so it, def it was definitely like the best Barbies in the world. I didn't catalog all of it because it's so specialized. We literally had to bring in somebody else to catalog everything. Um, so I was just sort of there wrangling it. But yeah, number one Barbie in the box, untouched by human hands ever. Um, That's the fascinating. I mean, crazy things like, because then it's all the outfits that go with number one Barbie. Oh, yeah. 
which in the Barbie movie you could sort oh, of, I, yeah. I was like, oh, clever. Uh, but like, it's the powder puff in the compact with the gay Parisian outfit. It has the powder puff, the original. Oh my God, that's amazing. That's so cool. So that's, so, okay, keep going. So we have the Barbie, we. Oh yeah, so I was at Doyle's. I did a lot, a lot of things, mainly American furniture. You have to do appraisals and be able to go through somebody's house and do everything, like silver, glass, ceramics, everything. So um, are you like cat like cataloging it? You're like writing like in the living room, there's a set of blah blah blah, and this is what uh, we suspect well, the value to be. In, in an auction house, there's sort of two prongs to what you do. Um, you have to put together auctions. Uh, so to do that, you have to get consignments from people uh, and then put them in the sale and you catalog each lot so that people know what they're trying to buy. And then the sale goes on and people come and buy stuff from you. The other thing that you do that actually helps you get property is appraisals. Um, so often when someone dies or someone you know is just doing estate planning or someone's giving charitable donations uh, to a museum or something, then I go to their house and I do a full cataloging of what's in the house. Okay. The room and you sit and you start with you know the fine art on the walls, you do the furniture, you do the rugs, you do everything that has value above a certain point. Gotcha. Um, I, st I still do, you know, I still, I buy and sell stuff now. I still do appraisals. I still do all of that. Well, and that's kind of what I was getting at is, and we can keep going on the trajectory of your career, but um, you and I, when we were uh, scheduling this um, talk, you said, I've got, I'm going to visit with some clients earlier this week. And you said, I'm going to go meet with, um, you know, I, you didn't ex expound, but my guess was that your clients were people who you were doing some appraising for. Um, I actually didn't do, she contacted me um, with things that she wanted to sell so a lot of times uh, people will say they need an appraisal and I go, do you really? <laughs> because yeah. when people say that, they generally just want to know how much something's worth. Okay. So I'm always happy to help with. I will do that, but I'll also do the formal written documents that like the, I the IRS just doesn't need our email exchange. The IRS needs a formal written document. There's also a bunch of legalese in the front. Those are not so much fun. It's the sort of buying cute things. Like that's the fun part. So would you um, consider that piece of your life, your sort of like main job right now? Or or, or do you kind of have like a multiple layers of things happening? Uh, it's definitely a patchwork. And it. I'm lucky that at this point, everything that I do sort of ebbs and flows at the right time. Gotcha. It hasn't been... I dread the day when this sort of like crush of everything happens at the same time. Like it could happen. It hasn't yeah. yet. But, but I, yeah. I, what I think is really neat about society today is that people are able to cobble careers together um, and that we don't just have to all be part of a nine to five, you know, office, you know, or whatever it is. Like you can kind of piece things together based on your expertise and consulting work. And I think that's very cool. It's, it is in many, many ways. And the way that it's not is, is the sort of financial security aspect. Yeah, that's scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very scary. And I, even though I have never paid a bill late even once, I have probably more money in the bank than I ever have. It's still terrifying a no lot kidding. of time. No kidding. And I, also, yeah, I mean, it just, it's a crazy way to live sometimes. And I just, sometimes I'm like, Maybe I'd like to go back to New York and get a job again. Like, I always oh. remind myself, great risk, great reward, right? Well, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so we are back to so, Doyle. Yes, and one of the things I bet you want is at when I was at Doyle's, I started as an appraiser on the Antiques Roadshow, um, which- I love that story. <laughs> well, I mean, the Antiques Roadshow, they're still doing it. They need- appraisers like people who know about stuff because if you've ever seen the road show or been to the road show zillions of people show up so they need warm bodies who know a few things who can help process all of those people and hopefully of course they want you to get on air so that they can have a tv show so are there producers like walking down the line just like talking to the people or people like you that are evaluators or how does that actually work well, the way it works, I mean, I did it for about nine years. I haven't done it um, of late um, because they don't pay you uh, and you don't. <laughs> You're doing it as a volunteer position? Yeah, as a volunteer and you have to pay all your own expenses. So when I was working at auction houses, the auction house would pay the expenses. But when I, once I went out on my own, I was like, yeah, I think I'm kind of done with this. <laughs> but the way it works is that, I mean, you'll see they'll put out a call for tickets, like tickets available for the Antiques Roadshow. Um, and people scramble to get tickets and they give out thousands of tickets. And the first thing they do is go to the triage table, they call it, 
and you tell those people what you have. Oh, I have a painting. Oh, I have a quilt. Oh, I have a chair. Oh, and so they and then get- they kind of categorize people. And then you have tickets for each of those lines. And then each of those appraisers has a line forming. Um, so I would, because I, at the time, at the time I was one of the youngest people who <laughs> was doing it. <laughs> younger people were doing it. Um, so I always got the decorative arts table, which was um, like the leftovers table. What didn't fit into any category of stuff. Oh, geez. I would get like the craziest things I get people would always bring in um like a stand of like their grandfather's pipes like smoking pipes I would keep and sometimes I'd keep a tally of how many pipes I saw how many walking sticks how many (laughs) crazy things and then sometimes you'd have somebody bring in something amazing and and everyone's so nice when they go like they're just so excited to talk to you people would ask for my autograph nice you're famous no, no, you don't know who I am. <laughs> so did you ever get on screen? Oh, yeah, yeah. A few times, a few times. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to watch the old episodes. I love watching that show. It's yeah. so good. Yes, I know. It's crazy. I mean, the whole thing. And it's weird how I, during that sort of peak time when I was on the show and I was on, on TV, like not a lot by any means. Um, but one of my, na- like imagine a New York neighborhood, some guy sitting on the stoop, he'd be like, hey, I saw you on TV last night. <laughs> you're like cheers cheers so you do that and then and that was part of your work with Doyle yeah uh, auction house it helps the auction house because you're on tv saying hey I'm from Doyle's so they were happy to do it got Um, you that changed when I left Doyle's and went to Christie's I Um, knew it was either Christie's or Sotheby's I couldn't remember okay that's the other piece that I knew (laughs) one of my friends from graduate school here at UVA she had gone on to be a curator at MoMA and then she went to go work in the 20th century design department at Christie's and literally every single person in the department had left. Oh no. Which speaks volumes probably, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Bevan was there. She was new and she said, Jenny, you, you could do this. You'd be perfect. You could do this. And I hadn't, it's weird. Cause I hadn't even really thought about it. Like I was just working at Doyle's and having a good time and it was great. And I sort of just hadn't even thought about that step. But I went, um, I was hired as a specialist in 20th century design and I was there for a while. And it was um, not unlike the move from museums to the auction house, moving from a small auction house to the big auction house. It is a different world. I bet. So give me some examples of what you were looking at from 20th century design, like quilts. Yeah, 20th century design, no quilts. Um, I'm trying to think of... Well, uh, let me help you out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what fits into that category? Well, we kind of did everything from sort of late 19th century up to yesterday, up to contemporary design. So uh-huh. late 19th century could be um, at the aesthetic movement, arts and crafts, art nouveau, art deco, uh, Vienna secession. Um, but like uh, furniture or yeah, artwork? Yeah. Or... Furniture, glass, ceramics, um, Silver went to someone else. Uh, I did a ton of Tiffany studios. So Tiffany glass, Tiffany lamps, Tiffany windows, Mm -hmm. uh, Renee Lalique glass, uh, all the mid-century modern furniture and design, um, contemporary design, like a brand new, super, super high-end design that people are making now. Uh, So home decor, not jewelry. Not jewelry, not jewelry. Or wearables. Not, okay. Yeah, not jewelry, not paint. We did some jewelry, actually. Some artist designed jewelry that wasn't, because you figure the jewelry department at Christie's is handling, you know, diamonds the size of your head. Mm-hmm. Them to see a $50,000 piece of jewelry, like they're, they're like, not. Yeah, yeah. They're like, please don't bother. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that. How so yeah, I mean, it was, and it was fantastic. I mean, I traveled the world. I literally went everywhere and you see the most beautiful objects ever made ever. Wow. <laughs> and wow. It's your job to know about them, to touch them. Is it in good condition? What is the provenance? Where was it? Was it ever exhibited? So you have to do some research. You have to, yeah, that's how you learn how things are made. I and mean, then that's how you determine whether or not it goes to the Christie auction house, right? Uh, exactly. So if you called me and said, hi, my name's Megan Holmes, and I have some things that I think are valuable. I don't know. They're from my grandmother. She said they were Tiffany lamps. 
I would say, well, fantastic, Megan, could you send me some pictures? I would love to take a look. And you send mm -hmm. me pictures and I go, ooh, fabulous. And I'm mm -hmm. like, and I'd love to come visit. Where are you located again? You say St. Louis. I'm like, I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you're thinking, ooh, we could make a little bit of money on this thing. Well, yeah, exactly. And I'm thinking I'm on deadline. I need to have some lamps. Sotheby's got that, you know, consignment that I wanted. <laughs> like maybe Megan's got the lamps for me. Got you, got you, got you. Out, and you welcome me to your home and I paw around at your things. And I look at your Tiffany lamps and sometimes I can walk in and be like, oh yeah, those are not right. Those are not right at all. I can tell from across the room. Mm -hmm. it might look great in person, maybe not so great. Hopefully they're fabulous. I arrange for shipping. I get it back to the auction house. We put it in the catalog, take its picture and get it sold. And it's my job to make sure it sells for as much money as it can. Possible, right. So the description and your research is, yeah important. Hopefully I don't screw it up ever. Occasionally you screw things up. <laughs> that sucks. Well, that's life. Yeah, so enter needlepoint, like share with me, when does needlepoint come into the world? Cause my, I'm, what I'm putting together here is that the context of the, of the design and the textiles and the things you've seen is what is kind of framing your ability to create, but like what to create a needlepoint canvas, but mm -hmm. Bring me into like how to enter needlepoint into the Jenny Sandberg timeline. Mm -hmm. Like, but yeah, it is not come in at this point. Believe me, <laughs> like I was at Christie's working away, working away, uh, and not when... stitching, not yes. Yeah. I okay. think all those hours on planes that I did not stitch. I mean, right? Horrible. I know. I did not start stitching until about 10, 11 years ago after I left Christie's because okay. I mean, at Christie's, I was like, there's not a chance. It's not happening. It didn't even cross my mind. And I, again, I think I was like around the corner from fabulous needlepoint shops. Like, what was I thinking? Yeah. Uh, um, I was not crafty. My mom was very crafty. She tried to get me to stitch. She tried to make it, get me to knit, latch hook, like every possible project <laughs> she tried. And it did not take, like not at all. Um, but once I left Christie's to go out on my own, essentially to do the things that I did at Christie's, but for me, instead of them, Yep. Um, that's when I do appraisals for people. I buy and sell stuff. So Megan would call me and say, hi, I think I have some things I want to sell. And I'd be like, thanks very much. I'd like to buy those from you. You shouldn't send those to Christie's. They're terrible. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> um, but once I quit my job, which I still wonder what I was even thinking, I quit my job and I bought a big house in Maryland in a small town in Maryland. Okay. Um, but once I was there living in a big house by myself in a house, in a, in a town where I didn't know anybody and going antiquing, like it was my job to go antiquing all the time and look at things. And when you go at antiquing, what do you see but old needlepoint? You know, you'll see okay. an old pillow and you'll be like, that's so cute. Oh my God, that's adorable. You see old books, you see hefty bags filled with pattern iron. Um, and you think oh, that pillow is so cute. I would love it if it were bigger, if it weren't, you know, orange, if it were, I wanted something to go with my, you know, my mid-century furniture that I had. And I, uh, and of course you never find quite the right thing. And then you yep. see old books and then Christmas is coming and I'd see old kits. I remember seeing an old kit to make Bargello uh, Christmas ornaments. Uh -huh. I was like, I'll make those for my mom. It'll be great. So I bought all the supplies. I bought them all on eBay, the cheapest things I could find. I remember I bought weird shaped cut pieces of interlock canvas. Uh -huh. I was like, why not? Who cares? I don't know. Sure. It didn't, it didn't even occur to me to look for a shop. Like it just, I don't know what I was thinking. Like <laughs> I, I, I remember Googling it because I had to learn how to do it, but I had the old books. I literally bought books from the sixties and seventies and taught myself that way. Um, so yeah, all of a sudden, and I remember because I wanted mid-century modern needlepoint. Now you think about what those books are and it's typically not so mid-century modern. <laughs> so, but I found this one book on um, Scandinavian. Um, it was like, it was a book from, I think 1974 called Norweave. And it's this sort of long stitch, I should grab the pillow, but I don't wanna be a runner. I remember that from early <laughs> <laughs> I'm not doing it. I don't have many runners. It's it's okay no, if you need to. I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. But well, yeah, I, I literally learned the first piece I ever stitched was Bargello. Like I just made up a big Bargello thing, literally like 12 by 18. Sure. Um, slammed through that really quick, did a couple more projects. My first tenth stitch, I bought a chart 
on Etsy and did that. Okay. So this um, is probably 2015, yeah. 14, 13? 13, 14 in that realm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. The only things that I ever stitched, I designed myself. Okay. Aside from those first few projects, um, eventually I moved, I moved down to um, Raleigh, North Carolina. Okay. Uh, I kept sort of designing my things. Eventually I went back to Christie's. They called me and I went back. <laughs> that was short-lived. <laughs> uh, but because that was 2018. Okay. And then I went back down to Raleigh. And I remember by 2019, I was designing my own things and I was stitching things. I started stitching things for other people. Like my uh, friend of mine, who's also a dealer, he collects needlepoint, like old needlepoint. Okay. Uh, I was stitching and he's like, can you make me something? And I was like, yes. You're like, yes, actually people now make these things. It doesn't have to be vintage. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> I, didn't, I remember I posted something on Instagram on my personal account and somebody said, oh, are you selling these? It's like, no, <laughs> like that's ridiculous. Why? It's mine. You can't have it. Right, right. And canvases I'm like how does that even work like how does the design get on a canvas why do you need that I work on blank canvas yep. how interesting the perspective that you you bring to this keep going oh, no clue at all um so it's 2019 by the sort of the end of 2019 early 2020 doom lurks on the horizon for sure uh, I wanted to work at my local needlepoint shop which was needlepoint.com. Oh, <laughs> so cool. like, awesome. I love needlepoint. I love it. I'm going to go work there. And it was literally, I think it was like March 10th, 2020, because I remember going there and meeting them and shaking someone's hand and thinking, ah, we're going to die. <laughs> so interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um. So yeah, then it was COVID. So I'm, I'm actually um, paying attention, but I'm I'm researching back because I think I'm trying to remember how I originally found you mm -hmm. and on Instagram, I'm sure, because that's pretty much how I met everybody, but I'm pretty sure that the first thing I remember was your work. Yes, this is it. This is it. And I've been talking to you about it every single minute since it's this. I was going to say, I know what it is. I, ha I made sure to have that one handy. <laughs> so... I think for me, okay, so so you're saying so 2020. So for me, I I um bought my shop in 20 in 2017, I think it was uh in September. And you know, I I knew some needlepoint but honestly not not that much. I didn't know designers. I didn't I was learning a lot at that point. But this was something I had never seen and I I love when somebody introduces something new. I knew of Penelope, which is what this is on. And we can kind of get into that here in a minute. Cause you were saying earlier that you were designing your own things and you use some interlocks. So for people who, um, and I'm sorry, I, sometimes I get into the story and I forget we're on an audio podcast. So what I just threw up on the screen was um, a, a post from Jenny's Instagram account from December of 2021. And I remember thinking, and, and what it is, is it's her use of Penelope. So for people who I like to try to try to think that we're still educating people through this podcast. So I just want to kind of like double back here for a second. So Penelope was um, a ground cloth used in needlepoint, but very European. Wouldn't, wouldn't you say, have you done any research on that? Yeah, I've, it's a Penelope. It, yeah, it's a double weave canvas. You talk about how um, our canvas today is mono canvas. Penelope, meaning it's woven. Well, it's meaning it's one warp, one weft. Yes, yes, yes. Sure. Penelope is a duo canvas so that your warp and weft are doubled. Yep. And that means that you have essentially a double grid system so that when your warp and weft is doubled, you can then push it apart. Yep. Create smaller intersections. And so and what Jenny and mentioned earlier, excuse me for interrupting you, but I wanted to get back to, so Jenny mentioned interlock, which is not woven. It's like stuck and it's like square grid, it's kind of like plastic canvas that you maybe tried. Some people tried. It made perfect sense in my brain. You figure if you Google it and you don't have anyone telling you otherwise, you come to your own conclusions. Because when you Google interlock, it's uh, the warp and then the double wefts are like locked around it, like doubled around it so that it. the mesh doesn't have any give. Yep. Which is really smart to me. I was like, that's, of course, that's the way I want to do it. Why wouldn't I do it that way? Because Well, and we've had some, God, I'm sorry. It made sense in my brain. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, so when people bring in a canvas, every once in a while, they'll say, I want to have this blocked. Like we'll just do blocking for people, meaning we'll pull things into shape. Well, we cannot block interlock canvas because it's stuck in its spot. <laughs> well, it, it, it's locked and there is no give. So once you yank it out, like that's it, it's all over. Hopefully that structure is preventing some of that pull, but not always, <laughs> not always. And I'm the world's tightest stitcher. Like I will yank a canvas out of whack. Oh, stab the canvas, strangle the intersection. Like every time. Same, same. And a lot of that has to do with my own stress and why I use needlepoint. Um, but it also has to do with like not paying attention and, you know. Yes, exactly. So I think because I am very self-taught, I sort of, I, I have a lot of imposter syndrome that like, I don't, I'm like, am I doing this the right way? Is this, is this the right way to do it? But so as I, you might recall, this is an art form, girl. I always remind people, you can use art however you want to. <laughs> but that's where, like, it always weirds me out when people are like, oh, you're an artist. I'm like, oh, honey, no, 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 no. I am you, not. You are your own form of an artist. Yes, you are. But we'll get back to that later. <laughs> So, so you're doing some things, you post something, people say, can you make this for me? Like, did you, like, I'm just kind of looking back on all the things. So you, I'm trying to decide what inspired you first. Oh, well, maybe one of these. Well, that, that was a, a relatively early effort. I mean, I think that, um, it's funny. I think on one of my early posts is that Mary Mecco, Again, I was really sort of looking towards uh, mid-century modern. Like I wanted something, I think about so many vintage needlepoint pieces. They tend to be a little fussy. They're a little mm -hmm. taily and I wanted something bolder, plainer, mm -hmm. simple. Um, and I think what really sort of opened my eyes, <laughs> and actually I think there's a, a pastel colored pillow in there with a, <laughs> a swear word on it. Uh, I made that? it, oh, there, it is, there should be. Oh, Some hilarious. Yes. Uh, if you're, if you're listening to us, March 22nd of 2021, I'm going to show, this is so funny. I didn't even notice it was a swear word because it's so well done. You designed this? Well, kind of, because that's the pillow that uh, a dealer friend of mine asked for me. He had, he showed me a picture of a vintage pillow in that general design. And he said, can you make me one like this? Can you reproduce this for me? And I said, well, I could, but it needs to be bigger and it needs to be more like this and it needs to do that. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, I'm designing something for somebody else. Um, and people always ask, well, why don't you reproduce that one? Cause they think it's fun. I'm like, yeah, uh, well, it's yeah. Robert Indiana. And then it's ripping off the person who came up with that design to begin with. So I'm like, yeah, I can't. Um, but what really did it is that the pandemic came around and I watched you guys, like need you guys with the needlepoint TV, just like coming to my phone. <laughs> loved it um but everybody's needle pointing you're trapped at home same thing for everybody uh nancy mcguffin at chapel hill needlepoint which was mm -hmm. exactly local but close she started posting her purses like a yes. zillion, she had so many lovely ones um and because she was kind of local i made an appointment to go into the shop like masked hazmat suit like ready to get <laughs> And, and she let me look at her purses and I was like how do you get these done now where does this get finished um and she told me about Chuck Pinnell um doing this leather work and that's where she gets it done and she's like you, you can talk to him so I called John because I have my snooty background I didn't believe <laughs> it's like I wanted to check this out I'm like is it really good I don't know yeah so I up uh, that I, I was in Raleigh at the time I drove up to Virginia and visited him and and checked out, you know, the things that he does. And he was like, oh, you, you design needlepoint, you do needlepoint. He's like, do you design things? Do you design belts? And I was like, no, <laughs> like, like he's, sure asking, he's like, I have, you know, I have somebody who's looking for some needlepoint designs. Do you design belts? You know, she likes Navajo things. And I was like, oh, like chief's blankets. I was thinking like hardcore Navajo things. She just wanted like a Southwestern thing. Um, so I told him, no, I don't design for people. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even think about it. I, I remember driving home and being like, he was asking you if you would design things for a client. Right. Like, and oh, you said no. <laughs> <that's a thing>. <laughs> no. <laughs> Dummy. So I get home and I was like, oh my gosh, I'd love to do this. And maybe we could talk more about this. So then I started designing things for other people and actually getting paid for it. And they didn't want a canvas um, because I do not paint canvases. 
Mm -hmm. They wanted a stitched product. Yep. So those were based on uh, Navajo weavings, a little kind of, not really, um, because that's, you know, I don't want to do Navajo things. Um, I did another one. Inspired by, yeah. Very loosely inspired by. Mm -hmm. Another one based on Pendleton blankets, uh, very Pendleton-y sort of design. Um, But, (laughs) and what that led to is that this client who was getting the belts, her first and last name began with the same letter. And Chuck said, you know, if you have any other designs that you think she might like, you know, she's just buying, she loves belts. She would love to buy some more. Um, And so I started designing letter belts, um, which I still do. (laughs) all those letter designs. Yeah, I forgot. That's something too that I just thought this is so clever. So again, like I'm I'm just cruising your Instagram just for fodder, but um these letter clutches. So I happen to have one. Indeed you do. Look at that. <laughs> Good work. I Okay, so full disclosure, my mother stitched this for me cuz I just don't have She's stitching for me too. Good work. <laughs> What'd you say? My mom's stitching for me too. <laughs> you know what else? You just you can't you can't do it all. So, but I adore this. And I think, um, again, this was something that I don't remember ever having seen on the market. I mean, you've, you see a lot of designs and and it's hard sometimes to create your own work that's unique, but um, Lauren always reminds me to look for artists who have perspective. And I think you've got such a cool perspective because it's, it's, it's unique and it's fun, but it's also like monograms, which everyone here in St. Louis loves monograms. So. <laughs> well, and that's part of what I thought. I mean, it's, um, I, like I, this uh, me and my unpopular opinions about so many things. Like I don't like designer things. I don't want to carry LV. My initials are not LV. I'm not going to advertise for them. <laughs> like, no. But if I had one that was J, I'm like I would be proud to carry that. Right? <laughs> Isn't that fun? I feel the same way. But that's ever to each their own. Um. But so so do you design electronically? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Um. Unlike. Wasn't it? It was Joanna who just posted like her beautiful paintings that she magically translates to canvas. I do not do that. I am and who not. Jenny's referring to is Joanna from the Plum Stitchery, who actually was my very first guest. If we're bringing this full circle on the designer sofa series that you saw on Instagram so many years ago, um, but you're right. So she actually draws and then or sketches and then paints what she sketches onto canvas. But you're saying. You use, do you use Mac Stitch or one of those designs? Yeah, I use Mac Stitch. And I, this is why I don't think I'm an artist. I, I, I always say I'm a problem solver because for instance, with the purses, I went to go see Nancy's and then you showed this one. Oh, um, so pretty. I knew, I was like, well, it's the, it's the pandemic and I'm locked at home. I'm like, I want to stitch something that's useful that I want. And what Jenny just held up was, do you call it the Holbein? Is that the one? Holbein. After um, 16th century Holbein pattern carpets, <laughs> there's one at the Met in the Met's collection. Amazing. Um, so it's a, it's like a, it's a handbag that Chuck Pennell has finished beautifully in leather, uh, but it's really the flap and the front and sort of a little piece on the back, right? Uh, yeah. The flap sort of bends around to the back. Mm-hmm. The, mm-hmm. But that was, you know, a pandem- pandemic brain thought that I was like, okay, I'm going to make a purse. How do I make a purse? I don't know. <laughs> You're yeah. figure out what you have to, so I could, I knew what I wanted. I knew the size that I wanted. I knew I wanted to have a handle and I had to figure out like, how do you make a purse? Like, what are the parts that you need? Do I want it all to be needlepoint? Do I not want it to be needlepoint? Mm-hmm. It's a lot of, of doing to figure it out. But I'm, I'm very, at least these days, I think when I first started stitching, I was like other people aren't just like stitch, stitch, stitch. This is great. Mm-hmm. But now I'm very focused on the end product, like mm. I have the end product and how to get me there. So like, it must really surprise you or maybe impress, or I don't know the right adjectives to describe when somebody uses a piece, one of your canvases and it's finished in a way that you never dreamed of. Right. Yeah. It's amazing. I love to see it. I mean, because I always feel like I'm uh, challenging myself with my own canvases to do different things. Speaking of, here's the same shape that I love. Because the other thing with these purses is that I'm like, this is a lot of time and money. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to do it. It had better be in a pretty classic pattern that I'm going to use forever. That's actually Uh, gorgeous. Now, so let's talk about the evolution once again. So I brought up the original Penelope, which by the way, I'm still trying to talk Jenny into coming and teaching a class uh, to kind of like 
dual stitch, the, the petty point. So does that end up being like a 24? 10 and 20. 10 I, and 20. I would so love to teach a class. Like I would okay. love it. Let's and schedule it. You heard it well, here first. Because <laughs> it incorporates so many things that people hate. <laughs> like Penelope, it's like, can you work from a chart? Can you work with wool? Lots of wool. So much wool. Big wool, little wool, all the wool. And so, when you do that, are you incorporating two different types of fibers or are you just stranding up? Well, that's the thing. It's like, what have you got that's going to work on 10 count canvas mm -hmm. and 20 count canvas? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Options are few. Um, I've used um, Waverly. Um, this one, this design, I was super clever because the middle, I made it so there's no compensation. Mm. So, stitches don't need little baby stitches in the background to fill it out smart that way yeah but you guys finished for me a cute little clutch for my friend Yolanda that oh. was Penelope canvas um where it needed compensation the background and the little stitches around her name that I put on it but I used Waverly for that it's not it's not easy stitching it's not like silk and ivory on 13 like it's 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 a challenge yeah but it's all it's all tent stitching, right? Yeah. It's just a little bit of a math problem. But anyway, I'm still going to talk her into doing it because I just think it's very interesting. Um, but so so you you're you're like kind of letters and those were kind of inspired. And then um, so then this last market though, you kind of well, okay, I'm gonna say two things. I was gonna say you kind of diverted from the OG designs, but what you didn't do is divert from your original sketchings. Cause I just looked at your Instagram and way back when I, I saw this sort of feather, is that what you call this? Uh, the, uh, no, that one, is, that one I call the pendant pattern. That's, that's actually based on a weaving pattern. But I mean, this background here, what is it called? Uh, I don't call that anything. I don't think <laughs> it looks to me kind of feathered. So I was just looking at your old sketches and way one, back when you had some of these. Yeah, exactly. Because I was doing, I used that pattern on uh, frame designs. Um, I did. You're absolutely right. And see, that's where like the market panic comes. And I'm like, what have I already designed? There's got to be something in there that's already done. It's true. Way back here at the beginning of your um, kind of design sketchings or like looks like sort of playing around with things. Um, there's some really cool, you know, combining, you know, like swirls and letters and this and, but this pendant again kind of came maybe from that first piece that I fell in love with which is that sort of pendant yeah because this one has the pendant in it and mm -hmm. I recycled that element onto that so that this is the clutch version of that I love it this is the eyeglass or the the smaller pouch smaller whatever you want it to be <laughs> tray but then I was kind of surprised I'm gonna be honest with you that you had leopard print in your line because that just doesn't really scream well, Jenny Sandberg to me but tell me about that yeah, it's again, it sort of came back to the sort of purse and sort of classic things because needlepoint is so labor intensive. And you know, mm -hmm. so many people are getting into it lately, mm -hmm. new people, and they're like, oh my God, this takes forever. <laughs> this takes forever. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, so you better love that design. Like, I work in my local shop, Poppy Point, which is great because it, as someone who is self taught, who the, yeah, the, the valuable experience of seeing what other people are doing, what other people have to say about stitching. When a new stitcher comes into the shop and it's just, and they bring you a canvas that's like an 18 by 18 square. I would like this to be my first project. <laughs> I love that for you, but please, please, this is going to take you a small lifetime to complete. So that's why with the leopard, I was like, I want something totally, totally classic. And other people have done leopard to great effect. This is hardly a new thing. Um, but I, um, the leopard, the leopard tote and the leopard purse, I stitched in cruel wool, what? like anything too simple, you know, so it's, it's hard to see, but the colors are blended so that each color is actually two or three colors. And I sort of shaded it out, you know, I don't, again, why make it simple? <laughs> I was just going to say, why make it easy? So, um, so I guess my next question to you then is what? are you interested in doing next or what haven't, what are you, what are you looking at or what's inspiring you right now? Gosh, all sorts of things. What am I working on? I just did a design uh, based on something that's kind of tropical and fun. Whoa, okay. History is still history. So much history. Um, here's an announcement for you. I'm actually changing the letter series. What? Uh, 
because I have done so many letter patterns. I mean, you can even see, like, if you scroll back on my Instagram, you'll see things you haven't seen before. I know. Now, as I sell out of a pattern, I'm going to replace it with a new pattern or a mm. new pattern of the old pattern. So um, meaning like if, if there's an R that we've seen, you're going to like, let that R sell out, do a different R. Yeah. Um, and people have been buying those letters a lot lately. Like, I don't know what happened. Like I think your bag. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, well, sure. No, I love it. And I love, I like a good um, unexpected. So like, I like, uh, like a floral and a, and a geometric. That's, I think that's why I like them. I think. Well, like, I know. And I, now that I do some of my own finishing, what? Mm -hmm. I bought a sewing machine last year. I'm like, I can't wait. You guys literally finished the last bag that I had somebody else finish. Nice. And now you're working it yourself. I love it. Scary. Finishing's really scary. It's funny. I watched your recent episode on how shops handle finishing because mm -hmm. it's a terrifying thing. I have people ask me if I'll do finishing for them. I'm like, nope. <laughs> I know. It's, it's, it's a liability, but you know, the people who do it, well have worked really hard at it and they take their job seriously so that's why it costs a lot of money <laughs> and for me as you know like getting ready for market for me it's just the speed mm. this thing could be like this could fall apart into a pile of dust but as long as it looks nice in pictures and can survive market like that's what I need from it <laughs> that's exactly right so you've got some more designs on the horizon do you have any trips planned are you are you doing any touring or yeah, definitely. I always, uh, I'm going to go visit Rittenhouse Needlepoint. I've never been to Rittenhouse. I have neither. Um, yeah. So I'm going to Philadelphia and now it's great because I can sort of combine things. I can go to Rittenhouse and then go antiquing in Pennsylvania. Mm. <laughs> uh, I do need to go to Ohio for antiquing. I have certain circuits that I make clients that I go see. And uh, so, and it always just depends. It's, one of the things that's been really hard for me between antiques and needlepoint is that needlepoint is a lot of long range planning and yeah. antiques is super reactive. It's yes. like when, when Megan calls me and says she has something she wants to sell. It's like, I need to go yes. right now and do it. Interesting. So, different ways of thinking, but it always leads to traveling around and doing stuff. So, you know, it's all good. <laughs> and so as you're traveling around and doing things, I imagine you're stitching on your own canvases, most likely for samples and things. Definitely. I always have, I'm like, so I don't even want to show you all the canvases that are like scattered around <laughs> so many I'm things. I'm not going to ask to see that, but is there any other designer that you're inspired by or who you stitch? Um, I have literally never stitched somebody else's painted canvas. Ever. How interesting. Oh my goodness. Well, here's a call. Anybody <laughs> who's watching this, send Jenny something and maybe she'll stitch it. <laughs> <laughs> and there are so many like great things and it's I always I mean I'm sure uh, there are some designers who have designed things and I'm like oh I'm so mad I wish I had designed that like oh that's so good such like, a good idea yes for sure I just don't have time like I'm I'm fortunate to have um some nice people stitching for me my mom's been stitching for me um you I think you met Allison at market um she was helping me at market this past time she's yes stitching um, yeah, that, and that is super helpful because, you know, the purses, for instance, I can't show up and just be like, it's going to fit together like this. I promise like people need to see it. So yeah, stitching for myself is pretty critical these days. I, I imagine. Is there anything else we haven't talked about? I kind of guided the conversation a bit. I hate to distract you from anything else you wanted to share with us about your needlepoint career or anything needlepoint adjacent. Oh, it's fun. I'm getting ready for market next time around and trying to trying to stay on that hamster wheel and crank out designs and do things I like. Um, I think there's always that sort of tension between things that I know I really like and think are great. And yet I have to produce things that I think will sell. So which means you have to guess what other people are going to like. I'm like, I don't know. It's hard. It's so true. And things that I look at and I think, oh my gosh, I want, we need to buy all of those. And then nobody's interested. So it's, it's, what's cool about this industry is that it is an art form and everyone sees it a little differently and uses it a little differently. And I'm just so grateful that you have such a cool story related to how you're using needlepoint based on your sort of uh, knowledge of history and antiques. And um, I just think it's really interesting and refreshing. And I've never heard anybody else say that. So <laughs> Yeah, well, every day I, you can't you can't eliminate all those things that are in your head, like the yes. things, you, and it just it comes out one way or another. That's exactly right. So, 
Um, if there's nothing else, Jenny, I this has just been delightful. And I'm happy to now have your story archived because I've talked to you about it a hundred times just because I personally have an affinity for antiques and history and all of those things. So um, yeah, I've all- Dealing, I know. I didn't even ask you about that. Say that, say that one more time. You did a little bit of dealing. You bought and sold some things. <laughs> Mostly junk. I I never I never bought and sold like the really high end things. But I did have a booth one time with a friend, and really that was because I love love the hunt of just things that I aesthetically like. It has nothing to do with any value. But mm -hmm. I like to use things. They're just valuable to me, right? They're not high end. But um, but yeah, I um, I did have a booth one time. <laughs> it was the antique mall there in St. Louis. Yes, just this little antique mall here in St. Louis. And she and I worked together as colleagues at a university. And so um, on the weekends we'd go to flea markets, and then you know once a week or so at lunchtime we'd go and set some things up in this thing. And it really just afforded me to keep like switching decor out of my own space <laughs> yeah well it gives you permission to buy anything because you're like I'm gonna fill it all <laughs> exactly it was really fun I'm not gonna say I became a millionaire doing it but it was really really fun and then I did assemblage jewelry for a while where you kind of pile things on yeah yeah yeah, yeah. well between you and Lauren Lauren with all the cute jewelry <laughs> I do love jewelry Lauren has good style too and she actually worked in um someday we'll have to talk to her about she worked for something called no, it I just forgot. The real, the real, real, the, she worked for one of those, didn't she? Luxury garage sale. There you go. And so it was, it was high end, mm -hmm. um, resale in, um, uh, uh, wearables, clothing, jewelry and things. So. Jewelry, I remember. See? It's oh. just fun. It's fun. And there's an art, again, that's an art form too, right? So putting it all together and, and yeah, so. You definitely did a good job of that by all means. Oh, well, you're sweet. Thank you so much. Well, this has been super fun. Um, so if you are watching us for the first time um, or listening to us, I always forget to say uh, thank you for being here. I hope you've learned something about our uh, Jenny and my and Melissa's little corner of the world, um, the needlepoint industry. And um, if you have, uh, please do subscribe on e any of your audio podcasts or on your visual uh, YouTube uh, channel so that we can continue to kind of get the word out and continue to promote our industry. So thanks for being here, Jenny. And um, I hope to see you again sometime soon. Mm -hmm. thanks. Okay. Thanks.